Most of you know we just got back last Sunday evening from our trip to Montana. We went out to Helena. Tasha, uh, a week ago, was living in Helena. She's now living in Denver. She's moved down there. And so we went out there to, to spend about five days with her in Chelsea. Our daughter from Texas drove up to Helena to spend some time with her sister. And then Chelsea was going to help her move to Denver. And Chelsea's roommate, Katie, flew from Dallas, or flew from San Antonio, I think it was, up to Helena, and she was going to help drive some of the vehicles back. And so we got to be there, and we did help do some cleaning one day. I got to clean the stove. That was my job. I said, Tasha, is there anything I can help you do? She said, can you clean the stove? Wow. <laughs> They, anyway, I won't even go into details on that one, but, but we didn't get to help with the move, but Katie and Chelsea did. Now, Katie flew in on Sunday night, and then they were going to be back in Texas the, the following Sunday. So Katie flew up there for a week. Her suitcase was about as big as this Lord's Supper table <laughs> for one week. And I walked by one day and I looked at that, at that thing and I said, is that your suitcase, Katie? And she said, yeah. And I said, how long are you staying? And she said, well, Chelsea said, you know, I've got to be prepared. It gets cool in the evenings up here and hot during the day. So I just brought a little bit of everything. I said, come here and look at my suitcase. And so I went back and my suitcase was like this wide by that deep by about that tall. And I said, that's my suitcase two weeks worth of clothing in there. Now, of course, we were on the motorcycle, so we couldn't pack quite as much. That's one thing that, that I've really learned, Dory and I both have learned, is that when you're on the bike, you pack pretty light. You know, I mean, you really have to think about, do I really need this? You know? Uh, what is it, New Underwear Wednesday? It really comes into play sometimes, you know? It's not, not really. I mean, that's only when we go fishing, right, Blake? Anyway. And, and why we talk about those things while we're fishing, anyway. But you, but you learn, you know, Dory had one small suitcase that fit in the trunk. I had a small suitcase that, that strapped onto it. And then we have a, one saddle bag that's empty because the other one's got all of our rain gear and tools and stuff in it. So you learn how to, to really pack light and think about it. But we do make sure that we have all of the necessities. We call ahead, we reserve our hotel rooms so that we know we have a place to stay. We did pull into a hotel one night on the way back. We didn't get there until about 10 o'clock, and I don't like riding after dark. It's like a, a guy uh, said one time, that's when the deer come out to commit suicide. And so I, I don't like riding after dark, but we just happened to be running late. We pulled into the hotel. Well, there was another guy on a motorcycle who had just come out of the hotel. They didn't have a room for and he had called all over town, and there was not a room anywhere in town. There were a bunch of big concerts going on. And, and so we like to, to plan it ahead. We, we've got all of the stuff that we need. We've got our hotel reservation so that we know we have a place to stay. Got toolkits with us. I know where all the bike shops are on the trip. I've got an 800 number in my pocket that I can call if something happens, and they'll send somebody out to get us. And, and with those things, you just feel a little more comfortable about your trip, right? I mean, how many of you, when you're going on a trip, put a lot of effort into getting ready for that trip? I, I want us to think through our, our adventure this morning. Think through uh, getting everything ready to go on a trip. So let's say that your boss calls and he says, Hey, I'm going to send you to, to another town to, to, to follow up on a project or to check over some things, see how things are going. And so I want you to get ready because you're going to be leaving tomorrow. So probably what you do is you, you make your travel arrangements. You either book your flight or book your a uh, rental car, or if you're driving your own vehicle, you might take it down and get it service tuned up, ready to go. So you make sure that you're safe and comfortable in your traveling. Uh, probably make your hotel reservation so that you know you've got a place to stay when you get there. If you're like me, I like to stay in certain hotel chains, so I kind of know what I'm getting, you know. I know kind of what it's going to be like when I get there. I, I did one time, Dory and I went on a trip to the Nashville area, and we stayed in a 
hotel that we had never stayed in that chain before, uh, but it was really cheap. And we laid down in the bed that night, and, and I laid down, and I took a look, turned over to her, and I said, did you put baby powder on? She said, no. I said, well, I smelled baby powder. And a week later, I was in the hospital with some kind of lung something going on. And, and we needed to say we didn't stay there that night. It was, it was, it was bad. So I'd book your hotel room in a place you know so you have a place to stay when you get there. And then you pack. You make sure you got all your toiletries, your toothbrush, your toothpaste, comb, although some of us are needing that less and less these days, uh, maybe a hairbrush, a razor, deodorant, contact stuff if you need that, uh, Q-tips. I can't leave home without Q-tips for some reason. Hairspray, hair gel, any other personal items that you need. And then you start packing your clothes. You're going to be gone for six days. So how many pairs of underwear do you really need? Six, okay. <laughs> Jerry over here said two. <laughs> We won't be staying in the same cabin at the men's retreat this year. Six pairs of underwear. How many pairs of socks do you need? Six. How many changes of clothes do you need? At least six. Okay. But then after you get all of that stuff, you need your shoes. Then after you get all that stuff, well, you, you might go out some evening after you're done with work. And you might need something to dress up in, so you throw in an extra something for dress up. You might throw in a couple of extra pairs of socks and underwear and stuff like that, just in case you have an accident or anything like that. You know, and you got to have your swimsuit, because the hotel might have a hot tub, you know. you gotta got to do that. So you get all of your clothes packed away. You got all of your toiletries packed away, but then this is a business trip, so you got to take your business stuff. You might have a report that you have to take, or some paperwork that you've got to fill out when you get there. Probably going to need to take your laptop. What's other? What's one other thing that you would absolutely have to have if you were going on a trip? Cell phone. Absolutely, you got to have your cell phone. Might have to have your tablet. So you've got all of your work-related stuff together. And you get all of that done, and then one other thing that you need to make sure you have on the trip is some money. You know, either a credit card or some cash or however you like to be able to pay for things. Even if the company's going to reimburse you, you've got to have a way to take care of some of your expenses. And so you make sure that you've got plenty of cash or a credit card or something like that. Now, once you've got all this stuff together, and you know you've got all the clothes you need, you know you've got all the business stuff you need. You know you got the money that you need. You know you got the place to stay that you're going to need. You know your transportation's care taken care of. You feel pretty good about the trip, right? You're pretty comfortable. You're pretty confident. I don't want to get there and everything's going to go okay. But let's say that you fly to wherever you go and when you get off the plane you find out that they've lost your luggage. And so now the only clothes you have are the clothes that are on your back. Not only that, but you've lost your laptop, you've lost your tablet, you've lost all of your work stuff, and you even had your cell phone packed in there, so you don't even have your cell phone anymore. And then, while you're walking around to the airport trying to locate your lost luggage, somebody comes up and steals your wallet or your purse, and so now you don't even have any money. And so you call the hotel, you, you, you find a phone in the lobby there where you just pick it up and it connects you to the hotel and you think, well, maybe they'll at least have a shuttle. They'll send someone out to get me. I'll get to my hotel room and, and there I will be able to make the phone calls and get my credit cards replaced, get some money, get my clothes and all this kind of stuff. And when you call the hotel, they say, we don't have a reservation for you. Now, wouldn't that just make you enjoy that trip a lot? What are you going to do? Be kind of like if your boss comes in. Let's say you've been working for a new startup company. Okay, you've been working for a new company, and they have just invented what? What's that? What they invent? Heated underwear. <laughs> He's working with a startup company just invented heated underwear, and it's taken off like gangbusters. Okay, and I can understand why sometimes. And, and he's been working with the boss, the inventor of the heated underwear department. And they've been traveling all over the, the, the country for about a year and a half now. 
And he has just been learning so much about, you know, from this boss, how he could, this guy can sell heated underwear to Hawaiians. I mean, he's just that good. And he has learned so much from him, and he's traveled with him and everything else. Well, one day, the boss comes in and says, here, I need you to be in Sioux Falls, South Dakota this afternoon. We're going to be branching out there. And I want you to go there and I want you to start a new branch of our company. And I want you to recruit some people to go to come to work for us. And you say, okay, well, I'm going to have to go home and pack. And he says, we don't have time for that. He said, not only that, but the plane that we're sending you on doesn't even have any room for any extra luggage or anything. You just have to go with the clothes that are on your back. You say, okay, well, where am I going to stay? Well, that's something else we really can't afford since it's a startup company put you up anywhere so when you get into town you need to find someone to stay with and, and then recruit these people well can I have some money to like take them out and, and, and you know wine them and dine them no so I have to go with, with no extra clothes no place to stay and still get people to join our company yeah now doesn't that sound like a fun business trip wouldn't you love to have a boss like that and yet, that is exactly what Jesus does with his disciples in Matthew chapter 10. I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles with me. In Matthew chapter 10 is where we are this morning as we continue our study through the, the Gospel of Matthew. I, I didn't write down the page number. Somebody using the Brown Q Bibles <laughs> yell that out for me. 6.88, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. I'd like you to, to read along with me as we read the first uh, 15 verses of this. It says, Jesus called His twelve disciples to Him. He gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go... Preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Do not take along any gold or silver or copper in your belts. Take no bag for the journey or extra tunic or sandals or a staff. For the worker is worth his keep. Whatever town or village you enter, search for some worthy person there and stay in his house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If it is not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, shake the dust off your feet. As when you leave that home or town, I, will, I tell you the truth, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. And I want to stop right there. I, I debated all week about whether to do the entire chapter, but there's just so much in it that I kind of want to break it down, so, so there will be a lot more uh, next week. But, but I want us to just kind of dig through what Jesus tells them here. In verse 5 and 6, he says that they're to go to the lost sheep of Israel, not to go to the Gentiles. Though later we're going to find out they will go to the Gentiles. Jesus isn't saying that the kingdom isn't for the Gentiles. We all know that it is, and thankfully so, because we are all Gentiles. But if you go back and look through Matthew's account up to this point, we've seen some Gentiles who have come to know Jesus, who have approached Jesus. In fact, it's interesting, the Gentiles up to this point seem the most willing to go to Jesus. He gets more opposition from the Jews than he does from the Gentiles. And so he sends them out among the Jews 
Some who will receive it, but some who will reject it. And then at verse 7 it says that as they go out, they are to preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Then it says that they are to do the things that Jesus had already been doing. They are to uh, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Those are the things that they had been witnessing Jesus do. So they're to go out, they're to be preaching, telling people about the kingdom, but they're also to be putting those words and that kingdom life into action as they go among the people. And they're not to do it for any financial gain. You see, it, it wasn't uncommon for teachers and rabbis as they went around and spoke to be paid for their speaking and paid for their teaching. But these guys aren't to be doing it for a profit. It didn't cost them anything to get what they had gotten and so they weren't to charge people for it. In fact, it's not about wealth the gospel is. Because Nick, the next thing he says is not only are you not to, to charge people for your services, but you're not to take any money with you. You're not to go out and wow people with how wealthy the gospel has made you. I, I read an article not too long ago about how we plant churches and how we... You know, we'll go into a community and we'll send, you know, 20 families or so, 20 upstanding, well-to-do families into a community and we'll build a nice building and we'll let them see what a blessing the gospel has been. And usually that has something to do with how financially well we're doing. And yet Jesus sends his guys out and don't take any money with you. You mean we've got to be beggars when we get there? Yep. Yeah. We can't show people how wealthy the gospel has made us? No. Well, what are we supposed to live on? Trust. That's a, a huge message that's in this part uh, of what Jesus tells his disciples to do is, I'm going to send you out with nothing. I want you to learn to trust that God will provide. In verse 11 through 15, they're supposed to go into this community and they're supposed to find someone who's already seeking the righteousness of God. These people, you know, one of the greatest things that God demanded of His people all throughout time was hospitality. And so you're supposed to find someone who is following God, seeking God, and ask if you can stay in their home. And when they welcome you into their home, you bless that home with peace, with shalom. And you preach, and you heal, and you do these things. Now if, while you're telling them that the kingdom of God is near, they reject that, then you don't waste all of your time there arguing and fighting and causing a lack of peace. You just withdraw your peace, you shake the dust off your feet, and you go somewhere else. Not everybody is going to be receptive of this message Jesus says. Now, when I started working on this sermon earlier this week, I was going to spend a lot of time talking about how we need to really get into these stories, especially in the gospel, these narrative accounts. We need to be walking alongside the disciples. We need to read this story as if we are a part of it. And I had spent, you know, a couple of hours one morning, you know, typing and working on this. It's going to be an awesome sermon. It really was. And Daniel comes in, and, he, and I said, by the way, here's what I'm going to do Sunday morning. I'm going to talk about how we really need to get into the story, make it our story, and see that we're a part of this story. And he says, oh, did you see my sermon from two Sundays ago? I said, no, I haven't watched that one yet. And he said, because that's what I talked about. And I said, well, let me watch it then, make sure I'm not reinventing the wheel. And I watched it, and there were paragraphs that Daniel would say that were verbatim what I had just typed up. 
And I thought, he's stealing my stuff even before I think of it. <laughs> and he did an awesome job talking about how this story, we need to understand, church, that this is our story. It's not just something that happened a long time ago, but this is me. This is you as we go through here. We need to see that we are Jesus' disciples. And He is sending us out to do these things. And you know, I've heard the saying before, you know, well now you've started, you quit preaching and you started meddling. Anybody heard that expression? And Matthew meddled with me so much this way. I don't like it. But he was stepping on my toes because he kept telling me over and over again, Lance, you're supposed to be sent out. So I want to ask you, what is it you pack when you're, when, if, if, if you were told today you are to go on a missions trip, today when you leave this building, you're going to go out, uh, for those of you that live here in, in Moline, you're going to go over, you're going to go up to Clinton. And you're going to preach the word. And you're going to do the things Jesus did. What are some things you take with you? Well, I was thinking about that this week. And, you know, things that I'm equipped to, to take with me. And, and so one of them is, is my degree. This is just one of my certificates. I don't have the other one framed yet. But this is, so I take it in my education. I'm a learned man. Okay? I can say a few words in Greek even. I can say Shema uh, Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Ha. And uh, Daniel can tell you what that means later on. But so I take my education because that makes me equipped. I know the things I ought to say. I also want to take some tracks with me because, you know, it's a whole lot easier to just hand somebody a booklet than it is to really talk to them, right? Right? Okay. And so you've got to take some pamphlets with you that will maybe start a conversation or answer a question or something. So we've got to have our, our tracks with us. Might even take a DVD. Everybody likes the multimedia these days. They like to watch movies. So we take this out we can give it to them. You're going to take a business card. Because after all, this business card gives me not only my name. By the way, Daniel made me some really new, very cool business cards with our new logo on it. And it's a catchy logo that might impress them. And it's got our church website on it. It's got where we are located on Facebook on there. It's got the times of our worship service on it. So see, I can just give that to somebody and you know, they may just show up at church. Because after all, that's what we do when we evangelize, right? We go invite people to church. Right. Okay. <laughs> we'll get to that. I'm going to take some cute little packet here because this has a lot of information about the church. Who we are as the church and, and, and all kinds of good stuff. So I'm equipped. I've got my stuff so that I can go out and I can do what God has sent me to go do. And Jesus says, Lance, don't take any of it. Now, Greg was holding up his Bible there. And I started to put my Bible in there, but, but I, I forgot about it. You see, I take my Bible, but Jesus sends these guys out. They didn't have their New Testament. They didn't even have their Old Testament to carry with them because the Jews didn't own their own copy of the, of the Old Testament. They didn't have any tracks to take. They didn't have any DVDs. They didn't have any business cards. The only thing they had was their faith. Their experience with Jesus. The same thing that we have when we are sent out. We take these things because it makes us feel secure. It makes us feel comfortable. It brings us, it doesn't uh, make us feel like we're out of our zone. 
We can walk up and we can hand something to somebody. We can invite them to church. After all, maybe if we can just get them to church, then somebody else will do the hard work of actually having a conversation with them about Jesus. But notice that Jesus doesn't send out His disciples with these things. And He doesn't send them out to invite people to church. He sends them out just like He sends us out to do what He has already been doing. Helping the people who are hurting. Bringing comfort to them. Preaching to them that the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is here. And you can be a part of that. You can be healed. You can be made whole. You can be well. He doesn't send them or us out with any comfort or security, but He sends us out with His message and His work and His provision. And this is tough. It makes us uncomfortable. It makes me uncomfortable. But as I read through this this week, the thing that Matthew has meddled with me more and more and more about is the fact that I was not called by Jesus Christ to sit in an office and wait for people to show up to be saved. I was called and I have been sent out to go where the people are hurting. Where the people need. The other thing that, that struck me this week is that you are not called to just show up on Sunday morning and maybe invite someone to come and sit with you. But as disciples of Christ, you have been called and you have been sent to go out into the world and do the things that Jesus has been doing and to tell people the kingdom of heaven is here. No matter how uncomfortable it makes us, that's what we've been called to do. How do we do it? How do we put flesh and bone on this teaching of Jesus? And by the way, if you will, uh, flip back a, a page with me or so uh, in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 24. Where Jesus tells His disciples, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, is like a wise man who built his house in the rock, and the rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against his house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundations on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, and the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against it, and it fell with a great crash. See, part of our discipleship is hearing the words of Jesus and putting them into practice. So, how do we go? Especially with an empty suitcase. And I want you to be thinking about this over these next few days. In our Wednesday night Bible class, we're going to talk about this very specifically. And, and so I want you to be thinking about it in the days before then. Next week, we're going to continue through Jesus' instructions to His disciples. And we're going to see that He doesn't send them or us out into any comfortable environment. It's not a comfortable task. We're going to see that, that what Jesus is sending us into is dangerous and scary. And, and one thing that we're going to see as we go through chapter 10 and we see these things that Jesus is commanding us to do is one of His greatest teachings in there is do not fear. Don't be afraid. You know, we were in a, 
we were in Pinedale, Wyoming. We are stopped in this little restaurant eating. Dory didn't see this because it was back behind her, but I watched a young couple in there really having some issues. I see that the, the young man, I could see his head was down like this, and I could tell he was, he was hurting. And, and the young woman was sitting over there just like an ice cube. He reached over at one point to take her hand and she jerked her hand back away. He was trying to talk to her and she wouldn't talk. And then when she did, you could tell there was a venom. And there was a part of me. It was like I was being told, Lance, You'll talk to him. But I was afraid. I was afraid I'd cause a scene in that little dining area there, and I didn't want to cause a scene. I was afraid I wouldn't know what to say if I got over there. I was afraid that these people would be mad at me getting in their space. I was afraid. Walk down the wall and you see somebody who's hurting, crying. Don't go talk to them because you're afraid. Go to the hospital and get on the elevator with somebody who's broken down. You don't say anything because you're afraid. Any of you relate to that? Jesus says, don't fear just go do what I'm calling you to do. Church, it's, it's not an easy thing. I struggle with it. I know you struggle with it too, but that's what we've been called to do. Is to go into our world. Help the hurting. Do the things that Jesus has done. And tell people that the kingdom of heaven is here. It's time, church, for us to quit fearing time for us to start having faith. It's time for us to go and do what our Lord has commanded us to do. Be His disciples. Take His message into the world. Let's pray. Father, these things that we've talked about this morning are so they're difficult. We've become so comfortable in our Christianity. We build buildings. We have big parking lots. Come up with programs that we can invite people to. We look for ways that we can easily bring people in to hear your message. And then we hire professionals to, to preach that message and to impress people. And yet, you call these 12 ordinary people, ordinary men. And you sent them out totally, in, in a lot of ways, ill-equipped. And they conquered the world. They made tremendous changes in the lives of people. They started congregations of faithful Christians who then went out and started other congregations of faithful Christians. And, and Father, the body grew. And it grew because these people heard what you told them. To go making disciples in all the world, baptizing them. And yet, Father, in our fear, we, we shield ourselves from that. We think that that's only for those who have been called to missions work. Father, help us to not fear. Help us to look around and see the hurting people around us and to go to them as your son would go to them. To offer help. To teach them. To share with them. That they don't have to live in a broken world. But that they can become a part of the kingdom of heaven. Father, help us to truly be 
your disciples. We ask all this in Jesus' name. If you are here this morning and you need to respond to this in any way, maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you need the prayers of the congregation to help you do what you know that God is calling you to do. Or maybe you're here this morning and in the past week or so you have come to the realization that you need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and be buried with Him in baptism, brought into the kingdom of heaven. Whatever need you may have this morning, please come forward. Share that with us while we stand and say this. Song.